what do we call that? London Brock Boogie. <laughs> IG, welcome. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much for um, getting on the plane. IG's just been here for an hour, just touched down at the airport a couple of hours ago. So thanks a lot for making the effort to, um, to join us this evening. Yeah, and thanks for having me. Um, I actually found, up, found out about it Sunday. So they was like, can you make it on Monday? And I was like, it's too early, it's too soon. So they managed to get me in on Tuesday. So this is straight off the cuff. We've got nothing prepared. We're just going to do it just raw. So um, do you want to introduce yourself, name, and um, where you're from, for those that don't know? <laughs> My name's IG. Um, I'm from London. I've been involved in many movements in London over the past, let's say, 15 years. Um, I've been involved in hip-hop, soul, funk, rare groove, the broken beat movement. Um, I've been involved in sound system as a youth and I'm also involved in new sector movements, son of scientist, liquid biscuit, quango, um, I'm a part of the co-op club and the co-op label, um, the list goes on, that's a few of the things that I do. And whereabouts in London are you from originally? Um, I'm from West London, Acton. Um, I pretty much grew up in Acton. Um, and now I reside in Labrook Grove. And musically speaking, I mean, you just listed so many pseudonyms people might be familiar with, but what was the, what was the first thing that you got into artist-wise? Well, the first thing that really got me interested in actually, well, because I started when I started it was writing lyrics. The first thing that got me in interested in writing lyrics was reggae music. Um, listening to the, the DJs from Jamaica, I was into the sound system thing. I got involved in sound systems and that's basically where I got the name IG Culture. All the, all the youths wh where I grew up, who I grew up with, they called me IG. So that name kind of stuck with me. Now I'm a big old man, they still call me IG Culture. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's fair to say that a lot of contemporary music, certainly from London, is, you know, from the last 20, 30 years, is influenced by sound system culture. Um, but it's a different thing growing up as part of a sound system. Can you tell us about when you got involved in, in sound and how that shaped you, you know, your musical journey? Well, <laughs> living in London, it's it's almost like uh, it's basically like this. So much music comes into London, and it's like almost like a testing ground for so many sounds worldwide, and we absorbed all of it. So at the same time as me being into sound system, I was al also into electro and soul music, and I was even listening to you know pop music <laughs> at the time as well. Um, yeah, we, we listened to all of it. Um, I remember as a youth, I used to uh, go to a place called Hammersmith Palais and I used to dance to a uh, DJ named Steve Walsh and Tim Westwood. He used to play like soul music at the time as a young DJ. So his roots, even, he, even Tim Westwood's roots, I know it doesn't seem like it now, but his roots kind of stem back to you know, soul music and reggae music as well, because um, it was Tim Westwood who brought through uh, London a London MC named General Levy. So Tim Westwood was kind of responsible for that. And I know it doesn't seem like that now because of what he's doing now, but he has got some roots. And to talk to me about the, um, the early days of the British hip hop scene, because that obviously had a, a big influence in your first group, Dodge City, right? Yeah, there was there was a lot of good things at the time. There was Gunshot, there was um, IQP, which um, ended up being Roots Believer. I think that's correct. Um, we we had so many groups, and 
Americans probably don't know it, but way back it was on par with what was coming out at the time because you know we were making records at the same time as American groups. And if you weigh it up, cheesy rap for cheesy rap at the time, it was the same, <laughs> you know. Um, it's just that, you know, America had the backing and basically, you know, it's, all, it's history now. It just went sky high. Um, I guess we kept it more real. <laughs> So talk to me about Dodge City. What's Dodge City? Well, <laughs> Dodge City happened by accident. Um, I, I was doing parties with a guy, you know, at the time we, was, we had a thing called the warehouse party where we would go to an old warehouse or kick off a garage door and hold a party and jack some electricity from somewhere and just do a party. And he used to rap to me sometimes some verses that he knew from some records, and I used to do the same. And we used to kind of take the piss out of each other. And then I, I hadn't seen him for a while. Then we met up again. He said he was doing a studio course. I said I'd bought a W30, which was a, a really old sampler, which, which had about 10 seconds sampling time. And we decided, okay, let's let's get together and see what we can come with. And within, let's say, six months of that, we had a record deal with <laughs> with our Island Records. Um, so it, it kind of happened by accident because I wasn't really gonna be in a group with him. I just said, okay, I'll do some, uh, I'll make some beats for you. So it kind of happened really quick. Next thing, we're kind of doing shit. <laughs> And what, what, what period is this? What time? This was 1990. Right. Have you got anything that you want to play from that? Or not really? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Have no, you got no, anything no. on your computer? <laughs> well, hey, have you got anything on your computer? No, no. Damn, you know you have. <laughs> no, no, I haven't actually. But how was the how was the experience of being thrown into that major record label thing at that age in that time? I was a ghetto you at the time, <laughs> and I didn't understand anything about the music business, and I got thrown in, and I just came into it with all my ghettoisms and kind of was a little naive and done things in a very naive way and made a lot of mistakes and fell out with a lot of people and learn a lot and it was it was that learning curve at that period that's kind of taken me here just because you know a lot of groups from the time you know at the time on major labels in london there were so many black groups signed um and when you check the groups then and follow their careers none of them has kind of lasted because it's kind of tough to kind of, you know, just keep going, reinventing yourself and, and you know, feeding the public, basically. Um, so I basically, you know, it was a tough lesson to learn. After Dodge City got dropped, um, I had to decide, well, what do I want to do? Do I want to kind of carry on the way I'm going or do I want to be serious about it? So mainly the, the Dodge City situation wasn't really about we was trying to we was doing great music i mean we were really naive it was about you know in hindsight it was about learning and then your project in 2000 right new sector movements ended up being signed to virgin i guess that was kind of like full circle back on the majors again you could kind of apply that learning curve to that experience well i was ready yeah um well between yeah, between Dodge City um, parting company from Ireland to getting signed to Virgin, that's a good eight years. So I'd spent the whole time just living in studio and, you know, reinventing myself, basically. 
Uh, I, I originally was a rapper, MC, and by the time I got signed to um, Virgin, I was a producer. I said, okay, I'm gonna have to kick some ass as a producer now. And basically, I got signed as a producer. And so what's the, the one drop thing in the middle? Talk to me about one drop. Well, when I parted company from um, Island Records, actually it was a subsidiary of Island Records. It was four from Broadway. After, after I parted company, I was vexed. And I was vexed about a lot of stuff. So I was just like, well, I don't want nothing to do with the industry at all. I just want to do it myself. Just like, I, I just got cold-hearted and ignorant about it. Um, and that was another learning curve because you can't do it on your own. <laughs> um, so I started this label called One Drop and the whole point was to you know, hook up with young MCs and give them an opportunity to you know, rhyme on better quality production. That's what I thought at the time. And basically give them an outlet through the One Drop label. And I ended up doing four albums with that label before Virgin started paying attention to what I was doing. And that whole period, you were already being asked to rem do remixes and stuff from Dodge City all the way through, right? Yeah, um, I was doing remixes from Dodge City right, right through to um, the start of, let's say, New Sector Movements. So I was remixing for Gangsta. The Loonies, Heavy D, um, Digital Underground, um, that kind of thing. And so, w how do we end up with New Sector Movements, and what is New Sector Movements? Well, the, the positive thing that I got out of saying, okay, I don't really give a shit about what's going on out there musically, I'm just going to do my own thing. The positive thing that came out of that was the fact that I just got into music. I got into, really got into buying, going to a lot of record fairs, checking out stuff that I'd never checked out before. Got into fusion deeply, jazz, you know, even more reggae, even more soul, even more hip hop. And I started paying attention to artists on the records. And I started paying attention to what they were actually playing. And so I ended up buying a Rhodes, buying some op spine uh hammond Wurlitzer. i bought the lot i bought a sp 1200 yeah. i just got all the tools that i i needed to um say okay i'm gonna be, be, be a producer and i always get like w when when we have discussions it always comes back to jazz and reggae basically i mean are there, is there is there any artists from those those areas or any artists from any area that you were buying in that period that you'd like to play now? Or um. I know there's so many, but <coughs> yeah, let me, let me, let me. This is just totally random. I'm just drawing tunes from my iTunes. Like when I first heard this tune, this tune just blew me away. I found it at a record fair. And that's the Heath Brothers. Any particular artists? I mean, I know there's so many, but are there any particular artists that we should run down in terms of like major, major influences, turning points? Yeah. Um, Well, one of the main influences for for fusion is George Duke. Like when I first heard, um, there's a few albums. There's Feel, and then I Love the Blues. She heard my cry. That album, and there's a <laughs> there's another one. I can't remember the name of it. Um, I think it's the first one on MPS. Um, but yeah. Um, George Duke is a big influence. No. <laughs> okay. 
Anyone else? Herbie mention? Hancock. Right. I'm into I'm into a lot. Yeah. I'm into um, Norman Connors, Horace Tap Scott. There's a, there's a load of artists that um you know the list just goes on a chick career. I mean I can you know, you just reel off names and they're just like albums deep. That's the good thing about those artists that you know they didn't just do one or two albums and fizzle. They you know they're twenty thirty albums deep. You know that's the good thing about those artists. They're not temporary. We're on that. We're on it. So, um, what's this? What's this? A, a loose cover of? Well, this is a, a, a group that I'm involved with. Uh, a group called Liquid Biscuit, which is me and a character named Kylie Tatham, and this is a tune called Herbs and Spice, and it's basically. Yeah, it's basically licking a shot to Herbie Hancock, basically. Thanks. You got another one lined up there you wanted to play? Yeah, I was talking about George Duke earlier. Um, I actually did a, a cover of a tune he did uh, called That's What She Said. So I tried to do a Bruck version of it. So, um, yeah. <laughs> One coming out. What is that one coming out? That's been out. Oh. That was that was that was about ninety four, ninety five, I think ninety five. All drums programmed, yeah. Yeah. And um, you mentioned uh, you everything on everything you do is pretty much is all the drums are programmed, right? Yeah. yeah. Um. Well. Uh, yeah, I've actually had drum lessons, so I, I, I've got an idea of jazz or something like that. Mm. So, yeah, if you can see it, you can play it, you know, or if you can say it, you can play it. So you mentioned um, Kaidi playing on that, that piece. You've had the good fortune to work with some amazing musicians. Do you want to tell us some of them? Um... Well, yeah, I've worked with Kylie Tatham, and, and he he's not widely known, but he's a giant. He's um he's he's a genius, I think. Um, I also do a project working with uh, a cat named Pina Palladino, who's been I've been working with lately on some stuff, and he's dangerous. Um, sometimes you're sitting watching him, and you're like. Wow. Yeah, I've been working with Pina. Um, on that last piece I played, uh, there's a cat named Erica Papule, another cat out of London who's equally as deadly. Um, there's a lot of unknown cats who can throw down. Um, so that's three, three names. Pina Palladino, Kylie Tatham, Erica Papule. Benji's getting into his DJ mode. Yeah. I think maybe we should bring it up to um, the new sector movements era and then we can go on to the, to the broken thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let me find the tune. Do you want to talk to us about this first new sector movements album and, and what, what the idea was behind that whole collective? Well, new sector movements started with me and a singer named Ben Besegwe. Um, and it later um, developed into Eska Mutunguazi, Kaidi Tatham, Chicks With Sticks, um, Julie Dexter. These are all people from London. Um, Virgin, they said, well, you know, you're getting a lot of press at the moment. We'll take anything. We'll take any project because they kind of jumped on 
the a and r man he was going to the boss with stuff a lot but they weren't really seeing it until he went in and said look he's in the face magazine and that's when the the the, the boss said okay let's do an album so they didn't actually understand what i was doing but they said well you know just do an album don't worry about you know doing anything commercial just do what you feel so that's exactly what i did i mixed up new set to movements with liquid biscuit and i did just some left of center madness <laughs> um i called the um i called the album download this and it came out in 2001 according to benji <laughs> <laughs> i think um what's this tune well this tune's off a uh ep which was um released at the same time on virgin um yeah we just w was totally arty about it we got those green to do the artwork and we were just being well let's just do a great piece of work with great artwork and throw it out there and see what happens um, so this is off the No Trick CP and this is a track called Para. That's me. That's you. The original. <laughs> the last lyric of that, that bit was supposed to be I'm fucking paranoid, but I said no Eric, let's let's tone it down a little. <laughs> but that's so some London's talk, some London slang, para, that means you're paranoid. So I think it's fair to say after listening to all the music that the focus is always the, the rhythmic element is, 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 a, is a central focus, right? Mm. I mean, that's a big question, but... Well, yeah. <laughs> so this thing called Broken Beat. That's where I'm going. Right. Where's that from? Who came up with that? Well, basically, I was doing this stuff. Phil Asher and Orin Waters. Phil Asher is Restless Soul, for those who know. And Orin Waters is also known as Afronaut from the Bugs in the Attic, uh, another London group. They started to call the, this kind of groove all oh, that broken stuff. Um, and there was a uh paper uh called echoes and they asked me so what's this stuff called then and i said well it's going to it's going to be called broken beat and next minute and in another magazine it said phil asher and ig culture the inventors of broken beat so yeah that's how it came about the actual term um further down the line some people kind of disassociated their names with it um yeah it probably ended up being just a thing to do like house you know let's do a a, a, a broken groove which is a kind of like a standard pattern now but at the time broken was anything you wanted it to be it wasn't meant to be mm, mm, ka, mm, mm, ka, or, you know. Mm. So that's that's basically the story of Broken. <laughs> yeah, but how do you feel about that? Because, you know, when you go to your club, a lot of people, you know, are now expecting to hear exactly the beat that you just said. So it's like, how, how do you feel about that term and, and what it's meant in terms of being boxed in? Well, we probably created a, a monster, really, because when we started the co-op club, in London, you know, people, there was only a few people in there and people would, would be like, what are they playing? And kind of just staring at us. When did, when did co-op start? Um, co-op started 2000, early 2000. So we're in our seventh year now. Um, nowadays, you play anything else and people won't dance. You know, they come there expecting to hear broken beat. It's that's how it's kind of developed in such such a short period of time. It's um it's kind of pigeonholed itself kind of thing. Mm. 
it, it got to a point where, where it was only being influenced by itself. And so... How did you get around that? By going back to the beginning and just say, fuck it, um, you know, let's make some music again, you know? Mm. Because it's not just about just being standard, you know what I mean? Just so that our DJ can have 16 bars to mix in the record. It's not just about that. There's that side, but there's, you know, there's, you know, keeping music out there to give people ideas and keep people inspired. Yeah, those first two years when it was at Velvet Rooms was some of the most inspiring times musically. But how did you, how did you, what was your vision for, like, taking it into the future with the DJs that you set it up with? And who, who did you set the club up with, actually? Do you want to name the people that you set the, pe set the club up with? Well, I set, I set the club up with Digo from 4Hero and a guy named Demas from a band called Two Banks of Four. Um, I knew I knew Demas, f f like from th from the nineties. De Demas was the producer behind the Young Disciples. I don't know if you've heard of the Young Disciples, but he was the producer behind it, and he came round to my flat, and he played me for Hero, and you know we were sat down and we was talking, and he was interested in what I was doing and this new sound. And I said, well, we'll do something. So one of the things I did was I got him an advance to do the Numbers album. So he he done an album called Numbers, which I, I released on the label I was running at the time, uh, Main Squeeze. And we also talked about setting up a, a club because at the time, you know, all these records are appearing. You got Digo doing this 2000 black thing, The Bugs and the Attic with a Neon Fusion, me with New Sector Movements and Liquid Biscuit, um, Domu, Seiji, G Force. A lot of these cats have started to do this music, but there was no way you can actually go and hear the music. So we decided we're going to just set up a club. And when we set it up, there's only a few people in there and, and the tumbleweed, you know what I mean? Um, but it kind of, it, it kind of just grew, <laughs> and it just went on from strength to strength, and you know we got a couple of awards out of it. I mean that's not the important thing, but um, yeah, it it really kind of grew. And what's, what was the musical ethos that was involved, right? What were the musical e what was the musical ethos of the club? Well, at the time, Digo was involved, and Digo was <laughs> Digo was like nothing. Um, uh, nothing earlier than like 95 or something. So we wanted to play all our music, but we wanted to play everything that we thought was good. So we, we, we didn't really want to end up just playing one kind of thing. On the original flyer, we had uh, Broken Beat and Future Jazz, whatever that is. So if you came to the early co-ops you'd expect to hear all kinds of stuff it, it was it was yeah you wouldn't you wouldn't know what to expect because it was all fresh at the time and it's definitely a strong open mic thing at the club as well right yeah um i think i brought that reggae element in it where i you know would let off reggae sound system sound sound effects and i would chat on the mic like you know yard style so we had the, the whole mix. We had the kind of that. We had the dub plate thing where it got to a point where, you know, <laughs> every track was a dub plate. Um, it's just like the same thing kind of happening again. It's happening in so many different scenes. It's happening in the drum and bass thing. And it started to happen in the broken beat scene. So got to a point, all you're hearing is dub plates. And if it's not a Domu dub plate, it's a Digo dub plate. If it's not a Digo dub plate, it's a Kaidi Tafum and a Bugs in the Attic dub plate. Um, half the audience loved it. Half the audience was frustrated because they would come back to the club to hear that tune that, 
that you know they heard a few weeks ago and they're hearing something fresh so we we just kept moving so far ahead you know at, at, at times certain DJs left the club and went to the studio and made tunes because they heard something in the night and it blew their mind so they just went to the studio and made music and that was like a regular occurrence it got so intense uh, some some DJs would come to the club like a guest and panic just because you know the, the crowd was intense as well you know it was it was a crazy thing still is yeah still is even more packed and where is the club now it's um a place called plastic people in london mm. certain man's no <laughs> <laughs> and um how have you seen the crowd change over the years Well, this is, this is real, right? When it started, it was just us. <laughs> then the crowd was kind of trendy and white. Then it was trendy, white, and Japanese with some sprinklings of black. And then it was more blacks. And then it was black, white, and Japanese. <laughs> And now it's black <laughs> with some whites <laughs> and a sprinkling of Jap Japanese. No, it's, it's just a mix. You know, everyone, everyone comes to the club. Everyone just mixes with each other, which is a good thing, you know. Uh, talk to me about that heads thing, because I know that does your head in a bit. The kind of the heads, the heads that always come down and want to hear, you know, certain tunes, certain types of tunes, want to put you in your box. Well... Last cop Sunday, um, there's a, a crew called the Laser Crew. Um, they've they've infamous. the infamous Laser Crew. Um, no, I call them that just because they always came and they'd be firing lasers. And I would back in the day I used to say laser, and they used to fire the lasers off. So it was crazy in there. Um, One of the one of the, the guys, his name is Cartel, and he's got this thing he spins around and it send, sends these messages in kind of laser light. So he comes up to me and he's going, Pevan Everett, Pevan Everett. <laughs> and and I just ignored him. <laughs> and I just kind of played what I wanted. And I said, Yeah, this one's for the Pevan. This one's for the Pevan Everett. So yeah, there's a there's a lot of heads in there. It's a there's a there's a term. Um, it's a new term. They call it man beat. <laughs> um, man beat is tunes only men listen to, like <laughs> in the dance, like you know what I mean, them style. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, the girls do like it though. The women do like the man beat, you know. <laughs> What's man beat? M man beat is <laughs> yeah. Play play man beat. <laughs> yeah, that's a big box in the attic tune. So it's great when you can create an environment that is that inspiring, that people are making tunes, especially for the club, and everything they're doing is based, you know, they're making tunes with that dance floor in mind. Mm -hmm. um, but how do, you, how do you take it beyond that? How do you make it into bi something bigger than that, transcending the boundaries of just a club in London and, and taking it around the world or making it into something larger? Well, the bugs definitely have you know, been flying the flag for that sound, you know, they've been DJing everywhere, like last year, the year before, they DJed everywhere. Um, and they've been really trying to fly the flag of the, the, the broken beat thing. Um, me, for instance, I mean, I feel that broken beat was just an accident. I was never really trying to make a genre called broken beat. I was just trying to make some music I mean, 
when I um, got signed to um, f um, when I got signed to Virgin, I was in the process of doing an album, like a hip hop album, and I had to stop doing that to do this. And it's like seven seven years later, I resumed what I was doing before, but it kind of took me d down a, a whole different path. And at around the same time you set up the co-op club, you also were involved in people records and setting up a different type of co-op or co-op amongst various label heads and musicians and producers and conveniently based in one premises as well. Can you talk to us about that and you know the strength that that gave you as a collective? Well, we were, we were all under the same roof, basically. Alex, Atias, The Bugs, um, me. All, all our music was coming up through uh, a company named Goya Music. At the time, Goya Music was really backing what we was doing. And we decided we we're going to do the, the co-op label, which was originally wasn't really linked to the club. But um, it was just a way of us to kind of be under one umbrella and push our music like together. And can you explain about the ethos behind actually the term co-op and how that you know how that translates into the label thing and how you all cooperated to make that happen? Well, well there you go. It's a cooperative. You know, hopefully the the idea is we just cooperate together, help each other out, and you know where we can't afford to pay. Well, you scratch my but I scratch yours, you know, mm. things like that. I mean, you've got you've been involved in People Records, Main Squeeze Records. What are the other independents you've done? Um, well, the One Drop label, mm. People, Main Squeeze, um, Co-op. Um, <laughs> uh, I did a, a label called D Below, which came out with two singles, and that was it. And are you still releasing records now? I mean, what's what's talk to us about the um, the independent record game and how that's changed over the last few years? Yeah, it's completely different. Um, from I linked with Goya to now, the whole internet thing has taken off, um, and people ain't even buying records anymore. Things have completely changed. So I used to say to my mate, you've got to be a label, a producer, a DJ, and a band. <laughs> and if we're thinking about starting record labels or wanting to put out our own music tomorrow, you know, is there any one thing that you'd say? Well, it all depends on what you want to achieve, really. If you want to make records just to make money or you want to make records to make some statements musically. Mm -hmm. yeah. And do you find, I mean, you, earlier on you were saying, you know, you've recorded under Son of Scientist, New Sector Movements, Dub Basement, Liquid Biscuit, Quango, um, Age of Selfishness, <laughs> Zuzu, um, various others. Do you find that that's, I mean, over the years, has that just been a bit of a hindrance, the fact that no one's really known that it's you. you. You know, you've done so many different projects that people find it hard to keep up. No, I don't think so. I think you just gotta be. You gotta be a mini, uh, a mini industry. You know, that's the same way labels operate. They just throw loads of stuff up, and whatever sticks. So I think I just use that same kind of thing. You know, I threw loads of stuff up, and maybe um, new sector movements is sticking. Yeah, or something like Liquid Biscuit. Mainly it's New Sector, but it's just like, it's just not carrying all your eggs in one basket. And um, the last New Sector album was called, you changed the name, right, to NSN? Um, yeah, I wish I didn't, because um, I got started getting um, messages from another NSN. It was like a Nazi party. <laughs> and they used to come up in my MySpace going, you nigger, you nigger. Um, so it's kind of um, blending back into n new sector movements. Should we play something from that last record? Um, 
Yeah, this is a, a, a tune featuring a vocalist I worked with, Eskamutungwazi, and this is me in my, with my down tempo head on. It's a tune called Don't Say It off the last New Sector Movement album. <laughs> So I know Thanks. you're a man of tunes, serious record collection, ridiculous record collection. I know hip hop's a big influence on you. Um, what kind of stuff, I mean, were you listening to at that time that went into the melting pot? Well, clearly, you know what I was listening to at the time. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just influenced by Dilla, you know. Um, yeah, he was just a massive influence. Um, and before Dilla, Pete Rock. I, I learned everything about hip hop from Pete Rock, basically. Um, yeah, it took me ages just to work out how he <laughs> actually did those bass lines, those filtered bass lines. I didn't know that he was actually filtering out the tune <laughs> just to leave a rumble. And I was just like, oh, right. So yeah, Pete Rock, Dilla, mainly, Tribe Called Quest. And talking of filtering stuff out, what, what are your weapons of choice in the studio? Well, at that time, I was using a S5000. Um, I was using Logic 4.7. Um, uh, MPC. Uh, SP-1200, and they were my main things. And around that, I was using like Hammond, Hammond organ, a Rhodes, uh, Wurlitzer, and all kinds of vintage drum machines like the sequential circuits, and even the uh, old Hammond Bon Tempe box. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of other things I, I, I used, like I on on one track on the um the first NSM album I used one of those old RMI electric pianos, like what Fella used to use. Um yeah, that kind of equipment. And you're generally using logic as the main sequencer for all this stuff. Yeah. Well now it's uh I'm using Logic Five. Five. Logic five, yeah. That's all I'm using. They just <laughs> installed eight outside. Seen. <laughs> well, you know, they upgrade so often, but we never really get deep into what we got, you know. Um, I think I want to stick with five for the time being. My mate Venom says he's going to uh, um, install eight on my system, but um, I like I like five. It's taken me a year to get my head around it, but yeah, I'm feeling five. And what's changed for you? You were saying that you've, you've changed your process, your working process. Well, I used to turn up, you know, to a studio with a car full of equipment and you know, it's just long. <laughs> Turning up to a studio with a computer, all kinds of equipment, and now I'm turning up with my iPod <laughs> with the track on it. It's crazy. Um, there's a danger of someone's sound, you know, suffering because of how easy it is to make music um, and I've really ha had to keep my eye on that and watch that and how have you dealt with that by not depending on a uh, kick and snare out of EXS because the waveforms are that thin you know it's just like a, a snapshot of a kick you know you, you, you hear the kick but you don't feel the kick and it's the same with the snares and the hi hats, so you've got to find ways to beef it up. 
And have you felt your music change as you've just gone completely digital? Have, have you had other people saying to you, your stuff sounds different now? Um, I'm getting more work <laughs> since I've gone digital. Um, well, I'm here, and I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting more work, but I'm still being real with with it. I'm still doing my thing, and I'm still. I consider myself to not compromise. I mean, it's gotten me this far by not compromising. Why change now? You know. So musically, you're doing, you're starting everything inside the box, and you're mixing inside the box as well. You're not going through any boards or. Well, I mix through um, uh, Pro Tools. I do all my mixing through Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. I mean, there there will be some projects that I will mix on a board, like a Neve desk, but um, I'm finding a way to make it still sound warm through um, Pro Tools. Any tips for us? Don't use reverbs. <laughs> So everything's still dry like it was analog when you're doing it in digital. You're not tempted by all those space designer plugins and stuff. No. Okay, I might use a little slap here and there, slap reverb, just to give some illusion of space. But I pretty much want my stuff just to be, just hit hard but dry. Um, I don't like, for instance, I hate when a vocal, this is just my personal opinion, I hate when a, a vocal is slicked up and prettied up b and the, the meat of the vocals hidden beh behind reverbs you know I want to hear the real artist and that's why when I worked with people like Eska and the, Lan the Lanubians I, I did it bone dry not a reverb in sight have you got anything from the new IG era any little dub plate to play us Something brand new. Um, one second. Um, yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm doing a project for a brand new label in Japan. Uh, the name is Freedom School, and they approached me and they asked me to do a concept album. They wanted me to do a piece that lasted twenty minutes long, and it just goes through all the the errors of spiritual black music, you know, so basically, you know, like, like, let's say how you would hear some jazz on a label like Stra Strata East. I don't know if you know Strata East, but, you know, the music was very conceptual and not, it wasn't really about hooks and stuff. It was, okay, there was hooks there, but it was more about just the feeling rather than, you know, the chorus. So I've just done something another mad excursion. Um, the project I called Zen Badism. And that was one of the other things they, they wanted it to be. They wanted it, it to be very black. The Japanese or very black or Haji. <laughs> so I went black. So this is a, a, a piece featuring. Is it the one? This is our featuring Pina Palladino on bass. In fact, I won't play that one. No, I'll, I'll go further in. So, so the next section of this, um, it's it's um, influenced by bop and like bebop and Sun Ra. Then it goes into one of my all-time favorite classics, "Girl, You Need a Change of Mind" by Eddie, Eddie Kendricks. 
Thanks. Cheers. The vocalist featured on that is a uh, cat named Bilal Salam um, from DC. So he's a uh, uh, name to look out for. Me. When's that coming out? Um, well, it was supposed to have been this year, but I, I kind of took my time with it. So I think it's early next year. Mm -hmm. So IG Culture, Future, end of 2007 and beyond, what's, what have you got coming up? Well, next month I'm off to the motherland. I'm off to Senegal, Uganda to um, continue our, our project that uh, I started f um, to commemorate um, the abolishment of slavery. Um, it was a project started by the British Council. Um, they invited African visual artists and musicians from all over Africa and they brought them all together, put me in the roundhouse in London over the period of two weeks. We'd never met each other before and basically we had to create a show. And after a nightmare two weeks, we, we had a, a, a show in place and now we're gonna take it to Africa. So that's coming up. That's one of the things coming up. Can we see that online or, or is it gonna be a video? Or? No, no, the information is online, but um, well, we'll see, you know. <laughs> and album wise, project wise, label wise? Well, the Zen Badism project is imminent. And I, um, I'm doing a album for a label in Chicago, um, Deeper Soul, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do an album under my Quango moniker, and that should be coming out next year as well. I actually went to Chicago for five weeks and recorded the album there. So basically, I worked with a lot of artists from Chicago, like Tortoise. Corey Wilkes um, and a lot of jazz musicians and stuff. So it's just the tale of my travels. What does IG stand for? Instant graphics. <laughs> Where did that one come from? Um, there was a young MC I, I was working with, a, a guy named Kid Co, who sadly passed away. And he used to just call me instant graphics. So I kind of kept that. So that's in memory of Kid Co. So at this point, it's time to um, open up the floor. If there's any questions you want to ask IG, don't be shy. I know we're all going to want to know the answer. Simon's got the mic. Hey, bro. Yo. Uh, have you always played keys on your tracks, or is that something you said you were, played, you were playing drums? now a bit um well it was just something i just picked up along the way mm -hmm. um i started off just playing one chord and then another chord and then i bought some books and learned a couple of scales and stuff and that's how i picked it up okay. and it was that you playing keys on the earlier tracks the herbie hancock um song? some synths but the um the main guy on on those tracks is uh kaidi tatham Yeah, uh, I was thinking about the, um, uh, the Broken Beat uh, scene. Um, I was really into that like m a few years ago um, and I haven't got the very much of a like um, clue actually about what's going on. Uh, but I was thinking about, the w you talked earlier about that the sound uh, has gotten a bit standardized. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like there's a basic groove and a lot of people uses it and in the beginning it was different it was always just about the beat being broke uh is there still um like any um, upcoming producers or producers that you prefer that are still really trying to progress the sound of uh, broken beats well it's difficult when you're you're not a hundred percent focused on it. Like if you're doing that plus your day job, 
then you're not going to really just make it out of desperation, you know, and do something like sort of off the hook just because you're focused on it completely. So there's a few producers who are kind of doing some things. Um, I like, I like, there's one cat, a guy named Johnny Miller. I like his stuff. Um, Sinbad's doing some stuff, but um, I haven't really heard a standout producer. There was a kid a few years ago, a guy named Hefner, who was doing some crazy shit, and then he disappeared. But he could have been, like, you know, up there. At least I, I, I recognize the name, so I can check it out. Yep, okay. thanks. Sorry, man. Hey, uh, do you think the interest you have in jazz that has helped you to keep pushing what you're doing and, and not sort of settling in one kind of style or whatever and, and keep searching for stuff? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because jazz, you know, you can't pinpoint it, you know. It's just always moving all over the place. So, yeah, it's always an influence. My question is, um, like coming from London as well, what kind of made you step away from the crime and the kind of the down parts of it and kind of move away from the scene like grime, for instance? What made you kind of, I know that's probably not in your era before, but what kind of made you get away from all the bad stuff and made you kind of turn in the direction that you went into? Because I'm a good art youth. <laughs> <laughs> I love music more than shit, you know? And, you know, most of my friends were in, into that, but, you know, most of them are in jail or ended up in jail, so I wasn't really into that. I was more into the music. Um, and another question is, because of, like, the software is everyone's basically got access to it, what can you do to kind of stand yourself out from other people and other people? Just do what everyone else ain't. This is like How? turning away. <laughs> well, by turning away, you know, everyone's facing that direction. You turn and face the other direction. Hi. Um, mentioned freedom school and it's interesting because I know Mark de Pablo who's also kind of associated with Broken Beat heavily in London do you think like now jazz is connecting with Broken Beat so is this kind of a good sign for the the label of Broken Beat is this where it's going to evolve into that kind of strapping and strap jazz sound no so no that's just that that's that just one of the things that um Broken Beat is involved with I mean you know, there's hip hop connected to it. There's, you know, drum and bass connected to it from Digo, Seiji, and uh, Mark Force and Domu. There's, you know, there's reggae um, connected to it. You know, as I said earlier, you know, London was just like a melting pot, a testing ground for so many styles of music and so many styles of American music as well. So we just absorbed everything. Mm -hmm. And where do you see Broken Beat evolving? Like in the future, do you have an idea of where it's where it's headed or? Well, as long as producers, you know, just want to make. <coughs> if if they don't expect that, it's gonna make them loads of dollars, you know. If you want to do a big tune, just write a pop tune, but don't do a broken beat tune. If you want to do a pop tune. All right, so any more? No? One more. Mm, you're thinking about a, a live show probably? Would you, would, you, would you have any plans to, do, to work with, m m with musicians live? Well, I've done a few live shows and it's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I would like to do a live thing again, but it's a whole, it's a whole different thing. When you 
new project I'm working with is with a lot of live musicians, so you never know. So where can we where can we catch you DJing? Regular. You can catch me DJing regular at the co-op in London and um bi monthly. Bi no, no, twice monthly. You know what that means. All right, twice a month. Bi monthly is right. trying. Yeah. Twice a month. Yeah. At plastic people in London, yeah? Plastic people. And worldwide, you tour a lot and travel a lot and DJ and all the rest of it. Label is Main Squeeze, People Records. Co-op. Co-op is the main les um, label and the Cooperate mm -hmm. is up and running now. Right, right. How long are you going to be in town for? I'm going to be here till Saturday. I'm leaving Saturday. Okay, so you're up for you know hanging out, getting in the studio, answering any questions that people might have. Yeah, sure. Vibes in. I, right. I am, yeah. So IG will be around for a bit, which is good news. At this point, please say thank you very much, IG Culture. Respect. Thanks.